welcome to the robot odometry and April tags presentation. Uh, so today we'll be discussing odometry and April tags on our robot. So how many of you know what an April tag is? Okay. Can we describe it to me? It's a you, sort of image of, well, in, I want to say, scaled up pixels of which cameras can use to detect certain codes and can be used for positioning by scaling things. Uh, I want to say it's kind of universal because you can have it at any angle and you can zoom in. You're on the right track there. So. Uh, we'll get into the definition later. I just kind of want to hear what everybody's, you know, clearly you're in a workshop to learn more about it, and I just wanted to hear, you know, what, what you know about it already. So, um, and does anybody know what odometry is? Uh, pretty much your position and location of the field. Yeah. There you go, exactly. So... Uh, I'm Jack Schumacher, and I am the programming lead on Team 930. And I am Evan, and I'm a programming team member for Team 930. And we will be discussing robot pose and April tags. So, today we will be covering what a visual financial system is and how we utilize it, April tags and their usages, cameras, on field targets, odometry, and pose basics, and examples. We will also cover the issues that we have encountered during this past year with using April tags. All right, does anybody have any idea what a visual fiducial system is? So it's kind of a combination of what we talked about earlier is your April tags and your odometry. So you're both using, so you're using both odometry and April tags to determine your actual position on the field. So there's a couple of examples that where it's actually used in the real world. So, uh, in Mario Kart Live, the game, um, they use April tags, or a version of them, to determine the kart's position on the track. And, you know, how many of you have played Mario Kart Live? Anybody? A couple people? Pretty cool. Pretty real world example. And then you also use April tags. Have you ever seen those studies where they have the ants like following a track or you know going to the food? They use April tags to determine where those ants are and then can track the behavior of all the ants. And this example here uh, in the Apollo missions, uh, you can see these little um, bitty targets kind of here. There are little crosses. And those were actually used as a marker to tell exactly how tall something would be. So they'd compare this image because there's no way they're going to have the astronauts you know, go out and measure you know, how big that rock is. They, they actually knew how big those targets would be and they could compare them to the size of the rock. So our visual fiducial system. Yeah. There you go. More examples. Yeah, and we have more examples. Uh, so usage, so we'll keep continuing on with uh, real world examples. So some real world examples are it is used in virtual rea reality, so you're using the cameras to determine your location relative to other objects and can use your fingers or controllers to, to, to move objects and change their position. Additionally, it is also used in self-driving cars where you'll see that this car over here uh, knows its position from the other car by looking at it using a camera and you know, determining the height, determining how far it is away, and then drives itself based on that. So, Cam uh, cameras that can pick up these systems include, but are not limited to, photon vision, limelight, or third-party cameras with processing capabilities, such as 
JVoy or even a webcam hooked up to an NVIDIA Raspberry Pi or Intel microcomputer. This past year, we used three Raspberry Pis connected to cameras to give the robot a more complete view of its position on the field. We placed one camera on each side of the front of the robot and placed another camera near the rear of the robot. This allowed us to read an April tag no matter its position relative to the robot. Yep. So we use two on the front, as Evan said, and then one on the back. So as we move around the field, we can see the April tags and determine our positions via the sensors on the robot. So a uh, visual fiducial system, as we said, is the combination of both and then the sensors. So you have your cameras and your gyroscope, and then you also have your fiducial markers, such as April tags. So first uses about 16 April tags on the field. Pretty sure, 16. Yeah. And then, but each April tag is made up of a four by four grid of pixels, and theoretically, there are about 600,000 possible combinations that you could make with just four by four pixels. Um, conceptually similar to QR codes, they're a type of two-dimensional barcode, essentially. Uh, April, tag, uh, April tags are really similar to QR code, although they have a lot less data encoded. April tags originally began to be developed in 2011. Uh, each April tag is made up of a 4 by 4 grid of pixels. April tags are usually used to encode numbers that a robot can decode to find a position on the field based on the number that the robot receives. So as we already showed some examples, there's real world markers. And then also in robotics, we determine the robot's position in its real world space. So we already talked about this a little bit. But any camera that can process images will work for April takes. You can use a webcam. You could use a Limelight Photon Vision or a third party camera with a built-in processor. You know, there's some machine learning cameras there's, um, that use processors. There's photon vision cameras. And your Limelight will also work. The updated Limelight will work, not the original one. Something to keep in mind with third-party cameras, uh, we tried to use a couple, <laughs> you can almost say questionable cameras from Japan and China. Um, those processors that are built into those cameras are not necessarily um, configured or programmed to actually work alongside some of the code that we will show you here shortly. So just keep in mind if you decide to go with more third party cameras, you might have to do a little bit more hands on development as a team to actually get this process to work. Yep. April tags can be found all around the field in important areas where the robot needs to know its position such as when you're scoring pieces or trying to pick up a new piece from the chute or double substation. Yep. And then they're also found in the scoring areas. So it, during an autonomous path, you can pick them up and decide, oh, this is where I want to score my game piece. I picked up this tag. I must be in front of that section of the grid. So what's the purpose of the April tag in the, in the world, really? What are we indicating on the field with each and every one of those April tags? Uh, the, the, the geometry of that particular spot. Yeah, but more importantly, it actually defines important places on the field, right? And they're common locations that your robot are going to actually go to. Yep. And the idea here is your robot, with being going to key positions on the field, should be able to get a vision of one of these tags. That's yep. why they put them where they put them on the field. In some cases, depending on the application, you can have a tag 100 different locations on that field all you want to give you the best accuracy that you possibly can. The yep. first doesn't have that many locations on the built field this year. So you got to yep. pick your location that will benefit you, benefit you the best. Yep. And that's why they put these positions this yep. year. Just something to keep in mind. Yep. And then, uh, so your odometry is essentially the combination of sensors, 
your wheel encoders, your gyroscopes to estimate the position of the robot on the field. And then kinematics is robot speed, linear and angular, and specific drivetrain controls, so like your speed on each wheel. So each one of those can be useful to use in, in separate ways, which we'll see when we look at the code here. Yep. Before you continue, also one thing to note with kinematics, um, it's important to understand that you guys can actually go out in the field of kinematics to study of movement. And so having a base understanding of what this thing is doing can actually lead to a career path for you guys. So that's another reason why that I think first is really trying to push the use of this type of technology because it is very much a real world application. Yep. And then uh, your translation. Just like in geometry, how many of you remember hearing the word translation or rotation? Possibly too many times. Um, translation is essentially just your movement on the field, right? So you're moving x, y, and then your rotation is you're rotating around a specific point. Just like, you know, rotate this triangle 90 degrees, it's the same thing here. But to determine your pose, you can't just say, oh, I'm x, y at this position. I'm at coordinate 7, 8, right? That's not going to be very helpful to, you know, what direction am I going to drive in, right? The pose is us using both the translation and the rotation. So in WPIWIB, you can see that that would be represented by the pose 2D class. And then you can also see rotation 2D, translation 2D, because, of course, we're just using essentially a coordinate grid, but it's an FRC field. So again, essentially the same as your geometry teacher would show you, you know, translating from this position to this position or rotating around this point. So this is kind of a little bit of an advanced graph here, not graph, uh, table, but it's more theoretical than actual. But this what is an example of what could happen if you're just using pose via encoder values and your gyros. So over a theoretical unit of time, is what this graph, this table is going to show. So can anybody tell me what they would expect would happen at position time zero? <laughs> anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to be, should be clicking. There's something that happened there. All right. So as you can see, at 0, the time would be set to 0. The encoder value is going to be set at your initial starting position, as is your gyro value. And you're going to get a pose of 0, 0, and 0. And your error, since you just started out, is going to be 0. Can anybody tell me what they think would happen at the next time we did this? OK, I guess I'll just show you. So at the encoder value at 1, yeah. So there's an encoder value at 1 here. So and then your gyro value. And then your pose is the original pose plus your predicted pose based off of the encoder and the gyro values. And then your error would be a combination of your predicted pose and your actual pose. So now that I showed you the first one, can anybody tell me the second time I ran through this? Yep. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to have uh, your, all, the, all the same errors as the last time, but as you get to the point, you're just going to fill in the space. Well, I can see it right now. Like, yeah, you can have five. Yeah. yeah. But, um,
Yeah. Representing the, the idea behind this slide is to show you guys what the WKLib post estimation object that you're going to be using does over time. Okay, it has a running time timer essentially under the hood, and at some given time point, you don't really know what that is. Well, you can based on yep. how you actually implement it. You will be pushing basically positions that your robot is registering through your odometry. And that's what we're trying to represent here. Your odometry has two parts, right? You have an X and Y position, and then you have your gyro head, okay? Both of those are very important for the odometry, the pose estimator to calculate this. where it predicts you're going to be, okay? And it does that under the hood with some fancy math that you all don't have to actually worry about yep. because WCLA has yep. actually provided you some of that function. After I finish this. Hood. But it's important to understand what's happening at every After time point as the robot's continuing and utilizing this thing. And that's what we're trying to predict here, or show you here. Yep. So as you continue, your error is just going to continue building up as we predict it. Because, I mean, imagine you're doing an autonomous path. How often does your robot end up exactly where it was going to be, right? It's not always going to end up in the exact same spot and we'll get to a couple examples of using April tags and how that is how some issues we've encountered this year. So as you continue you can see error is going to build up until say we get to time 1000 and yeah so uh, as we continue here error is going to continue to build and we'll go to the next slide. So what do you think is a way to remove some of the error that is piled up? Like, How would we go about doing that? You yes. set it when you get data from the April tag. Exactly, when you get a visual position from the field. Yep. And that's? Yep, right there. Right there. Yep. And then once a position is established from the cameras, it can be used to resolve the error that is piled up. Uh, the error becomes massive over time, resulting in a serious difference between the estimated position of the robot and the actual position of the robot. So you, the thousand, it's a big difference. Uh, with cameras, the error is drastically reduced in comparison to with estimation using odometry. Uh, cameras allow the robot to know exactly where it is on the field using April tags. Uh, this past year, we've encountered many issues when using our cameras in photon vision. So I want to ask everyone, um, how often do you think you want to try to grab a camera position during your competition? Probably whenever you score a game piece. Sure. Okay. Um, think a little bit more simplistic, right? What is the camera position based off of? Your orientation on the camera. Nope. Location. Huh? Location. Location, and how do we get that location? What do we use to get that official location? What's the point of this presentation? April the April tag. Yep. Right. So the moment you see an April tag, you guys, you want your robot to capture that position because that is a more absolute defined position on the field. Your odometry as your encoder skip, as chain skip, as you get bumped around, whatever it is, it throws off the accuracy of your odometry through the time, through your competition. Cameras, however, those April tags don't move, they can't be affected, they are solidified positions on the field. So the idea here is, the moment you get a, a vision of a tag, you wanna capture that as soon as possible and put it into your odometry, because that will reset that error and make your estimated position more accurate, because it's a running average of all your positions, essentially, is what your estimated position is during this pose estimation. So. That's why it's important to understand what those April tags represent and also position your cameras in such a way that you can capture those when they can. But the thing is, is you can't always guarantee to see a, cam uh, a tag. So you can't rely on it as hard as you can as your odometry. Because your odometry is always there, no matter what. But the tag is not always visible by your robot. So that's why you only use the cameras to correct your error. And that's what it does under the hood. And that's what we're trying to represent here. Yep.
So before we move on to the next slide, how many of your teams have used April tags, cameras this past year? Has anybody used them? Okay, what team are you with? Okay. Okay. So the next slide is we're going to share our experiences with vision this season. And uh, as Matt alluded to, yes, April tags are fixed position, but there's some issues that can cause them to not be fixed position. I'll show you what I mean. Like I. Okay, so this is a match video from the Greater Pittsburgh Regional, and we're in the top. The top left, right there. Yeah, right there. 15 second autonomous period Before. during this match. Both alliances scoring here. Team ninth. 30 autonomously picks up another cue. All right, there you go. It, it should cut off right there, so you can just escape. You might have to relaunch. We're having technical issues because we're running OBS on these yeah. laptops to capture the video. All right, I'm going to see if I can just click the next slide, and it'll go back. No. Okay. Yeah, it's escape. Escape. <laughs> That's actually a good one to go off. All right, so we just looked at, yep, I know. Okay, uh, when in using our cameras on the competition field, we encountered significant issues with the reflections of the plexiglass on many parts of the field. The reflections caused many, caused the bounding box of the April tags to be significantly off. We especially encountered this issue in the greater Pittsburgh regional, uh, where the bounding box would jump significantly during, a, during autonomous due to reflections off of the double substation, causing the autonomous path to be slightly different from slight, slightly different during from what it was intended to be, causing us to become wedged on the charge station during autonomous. This is just one of the many examples of reflections causing a robust position to be significantly different than its intended one. So you can see in this match, that is the match we just watched over there. So you can see we start off and it does briefly know our position on the field there. You saw at the beginning, it kind of is approximately correct. But since there's so much reflection off of the cube shelves and near the human player station, our robot is picking that up and believing that that is the bounding box for the April tag, which goes around the April tag and lets the robot know where the April tag is. So if you look at photon vision, you'd see like a green box around your April tag. So you can see we start jumping all over, and this is the log pulled up in advantage scope of one of the cameras on the robot. And we only decided to log one just to be able to see issues like this, uh, where the ca to know where the camera thinks we are versus where we actually are. So you see it goes all crazy there, and then right at the end, it does accurately detect that we are on the charge station. So it would work some of the time, but once we were on the charge station, or once we were really moving around, the reflection would kind of throw us off. Uh, additionally, we encountered issues with the voltage uh, provided to the cameras. Uh, the voltage to the cameras would suddenly drop out. Uh, and then off, after the, all these issues, we determined that the cameras on a robot would require more work in the off season. Uh, this summer, we are working to resolve the issues that we encountered with the cameras this year, uh, turning to more accurately pick up April tag target in reflective conditions and improving the voltage regulation issues that we encountered. We are working to improve our algorithm for estimating the position of the robot to prevent incidents such as this. Yep. So at Pittsburgh, some of the stuff we tried was we did try reducing the brightness on uh, photon vision while we, in between matches, like we'd see stuff like this, and then we'd try to you know 
reduce the brightness, reduce the exposure, anything to try to uh, improve the detection of the bounding box around the April tag. And then uh, with the voltage issues, um, as far as I understand, there was a connection. The Raspberry Pis were drawing too much, and we were having Pis rebooting during the match. So, you know, all of a sudden you'd have two of your cameras die, and then you have one to ac accurately pick up. So it's a less good scenario is you have less actual targets to pick up. below a certain voltage it actually shuts your pie off and so we weren't giving the pies enough voltage is the problem because we had three cameras running on our robot yep. and connected and pulling the power from our pdh yep and so we're trying to figure out a better way to provide more consistent power to our cameras so that way they don't shut down. yeah has anyone else used april tag i don't know i didn't catch that i think there was i know you are you guys have have you had what kind of problems have you guys come across yeah. Okay. So eventually we figured that out and you could ignore like that tag number, those two tag numbers, um, and it got a lot better. Okay. Um, later on they did release a fix for it. Okay, yeah. We didn't see any reflection problems. Yeah, whenever, during one of these matches during Pittsburgh, we actually had the drive station team bring up our stream and watch, our drive captain would watch it and he would, the camera, the, the robot would see the tag and all of a sudden, so it puts like what uh, Jack said, a, a green box around the April tag, and all of a sudden the green box would just stretch across the screen because it would capture a reflection on that on the charge station, and it just throws the entire calculation. And that's what you can see those lines there are. Is it just jumping around of where it thinks the robot is on the field? One other one that's good to know. We, we have way different accuracy if we see one tag versus two. So we did try to go to using two tags. Um, because we were, the documentation and the algorithms under the hood, they're designed to actually use more than one tag. And so the w, the um, we use Photon Vision's library to do the pose estimation, and they, like halfway through the season, put in the two tag support. We were trying to do a lot of that by hand. We did get some of that working by hand, but we struggled a little bit with that. And so we went to the WPI, the, the pose estimation, the photon version of the pose estimation kind of works, but anytime you get nothing but less than or more than two, we got more problems. That yep. We're trying to figure out. Yep. So. This summer we'll work on implementing some more fixes. So just keep in mind this is first first year to actually yeah. do this, and next year you guys will not have reflective tags, so or reflective tape on the field. They're completely going away with that. So if you haven't started using this, I highly recommend. Yep. And it offers a lot of useful features. So in future games, there could be more than 16. There, it, it offers first a lot of opportunities on ways to expand the game, make it more autonomous. And this year you saw some teams using it to be able to score more effectively, uh, using autonomous scoring and just knowing your position and saying, oh, I want to go high or I want to go low. So continuing. Okay, the WPI lab provides pre-made classes for pose estimation. Calibrating cameras is very important because bad camera calibration can lead to bad pose estimation. Uh, bad camera calibration could lead uh, could ruin a perfectly good autonomous path. Yeah. So if your camera is calibrated, so your tag, your actual position versus the tag is significantly different, you know, you could end up 
running into the charge station like we did in that match. That wasn't camera calibration, but you know something like that could happen, where your bounding box is not correctly centered on the April tag, so it isn't going to be able to pick it up as nicely. Um, Scroll up here, and now I can't find where it was. All right. Actually, here. Click the wrong slide. All right. So uh, you can see that WPI Web has a couple classes here. So we have differential drive, swerve drive, mechanum drive, and all just different types of drive trains. So you can estimate your position more effectively. So um, you can use standard deviations for your encoder and gyro so you can more accurately predict a position with a little bit of error so you know your your gyroscope's not always going to have the perfect position it might be a little bit more might be a little bit less and then uh, we can use vision with a low frame rates and then uh, WPI web has a lot of documentation about aspects of photon vision so um, it has um, just using cameras, it walks you through how to set it up, walks you through the hardware you might need, walks you through the basics of April tags. So it takes you from all the way from April tags to hopefully having a completed robot where you can simulate, you can test the position of the April tag on the field. UG. And then uh, you also have to use the the 2023 beta fo photon library because that was the first year that it was offered, and um, the photon library objects are you have the photon camera, which is pretty clearly your camera that you're going to be reading the tag with, and then important WPI web elements are your swerve drive pose estimator or your mechanum drive pose estimator or your differential drive depending on the type of drivetrain that you have. So Evan I'm going to have you talk about this one. Okay. Uh, this is an example of photon vision code. Uh, first we determine the encoder position from the drivetrain then we determine the odometry of the robot in order to determine its position on the field. Finally we are able to determine the position of the robot on the field using the vision system on board the robot. The positions are logged to an array that can be used as a coordinate system to determine the robot's position on the field. Uh, the visual position can be used to establish the actual position on the, of the robot and remove much, if not all, of the error resulting from estimating your position using odometry and encoder positions. And then uh, back to the previous slide here, I clicked the wrong slide. So this is inside WPI Lib. Um, it is a JSON file of essentially the position on the field, the XY, X, Y, and Z position on the field of each of the April tags. So you can see the first ID, the second ID, and all the way up to 16 if I were to screen capture the entire bit of code. So you'll put this in and then you will use that versus where your cameras are to determine where your actual April tag is. And we, it's pre-installed with the library, yeah. you guys don't have to do anything with that. The idea there is just to tell you guys and make you guys understand how FIRST tracks all of those tags. So they provide a JSON file, I don't know if you guys know what JSON is, but it's essentially just a key value pair, uh, a bunch of key value, value pairs and for every April tag, they have a bunch of information you can pull from those, um, those each and every one of those IDs, because each tag represents an ID. And so this is what you guys, when you go read the tag, when you go go to the photon pose estimation and you go and say, give me which tag you're looking at, you will take that ID and you will pull the information you need to help figure out what is your position on the field. Yep, you can see positions on the field, rotation, translation, etc. We already went over this slide. So um, you're using your, your first is your drivetrain, second is where you are, your gyro, and then third is your vision.
and then you can calculate your position here using the pose 2D class and then you can use your pose estimator to determine your actual position. So here are some important links. So you have your WPI lib, uh, your state space and model control about the April tags, what a fiducial marker is, and your WPI, uh, your photon library. And that WPI lib is probably one of the most important because it just walks you through anything from you know, learning about April tags and what the points of them are and why you should use them to um, control your robot and then all the way down through you know, basics of like fiducial markers. So as a recap, I got clicked before. Yep. So as a recap, we uh, learned about the ins and outs of pose estimation. Uh, we determined the issues that can be caused through bad camera calibration, um, issues with reflectiveness and voltage irregularities, and um, we discussed the intricacies of developing code to help determine the robot, uh, the position of the robot on the field. Does anyone have any examples of where a visual fiducial system could be used in real life? Does anyone remember any of those examples? Yes. Yes. Any others? Yeah. VR, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Mario Kart. Yeah. Probably the coolest one. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. Yep, there we go. Do you guys have any questions for us right now? Were you supposed to post PowerPoint? Yep. Yep. Thank you. 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 Thank
because again, this is fairly new to everyone. Um, we're seeing a big cry for help on this. We did this at the WCCC um, day for first this year, and we had a ha bunch of people in there saying they needed help and understanding this. So yeah. again, this is all you're gonna have next year. So I highly recommend you guys spend some time this summer and try to figure this stuff out. Yeah. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask. Yep. Thank you.